Welcome back to MMA Al Dente. I am the guy who is desperately trying to project confidence here, even though I lost all my confidence last week when I got my ass kicked from the opening fight to the final fight. Even Sharalampus Gregorio had to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Couldn't even give me that one. But it's okay, because that was the shittiest fucking card in MMA history. But up here, we have a bona fide pay-per-view card in UFC 305. This one is stacked, and I plan on making things right from last week. We'll see how things go. But at the very least, we're going to see some awesome MMA. No more of this fucking Chelsea Chandler shit. Opening up the main card for UFC 305, we have Carlos Pratas versus Li Jingliang. My prediction for this fight, and I say this with so much hesitation, you can't even fucking imagine. I'm going with Li Jingliang the win. The reason for the hesitation is because last week I got burnt chasing after every underdog on the card like a fucking idiot. But if you did put a gun to my head and said, hey, who wins, Pratas or Li? I'd go with Li. But even if he wasn't my pick, he'd be my bet. He's sitting at plus 250, five to two underdog. Yeah, Lee's better than that. The doubt is that he's 36 years old and he's coming off of a two-year layoff. That's not nothing. I'm 38 years old. I'm about to die. So he's on his way there. But Lee Jingliang is still what I consider to be, who I consider to be the most dangerous welterweight in the UFC. He's been the first guy to knock out Elizabeth Zaleski Dos Santos, the first guy to knock out Muslim Salikov. The majority of his wins inside the octagon are knockouts. So even though Carlos Prates is such a potently dangerous knockout artist and a more diverse knockout artist, and I totally admit he could prove to be better and more dangerous than Lee as a UFC fighter. But Lee is still up there where his power is more than enough to threaten Carlos Pratas in a way that he's not threatened by most other welterweights, even at the UFC level. And on top of all that, Li Jingliang, despite the two-year layoff and all the other horseshit I just said, he's incredibly tough. He's got a lot of great traits that while you can have doubts starting to creep in, you can't be certain that any of these traits are going to fail him. He's never been knocked out. He's been knocked down a bunch, and I've revisited every one of those knockdowns coming into this fight here, but he's still never been knocked out. The two times he was submitted are technical rear naked chokes. Submitted to Kieta Nakamura and Hamza Chemaev. The technical part means he did not tap, which just speaks to another level of toughness for Li Jingliang and grit. So he's not a quitter. Physically, I, I can't say I have the most faith in his health, but I trust it. Although, standing up to the danger of Carlos Pratas might be too much for him, even if he wasn't coming off a two-year layoff. I concede that Pratas is so fucking dangerous, and with that unique Muay Thai danger, he could catch him with a knee to the body and take him out of the fight. But let me get back on track to blowing Lee here. And Lee, on top of all this toughness and that power, he's got that UFC experience. He's been in there in plenty of deep firefights with a, with a lot of high-level fighters. And it's just a, uh, even though they have similar records, he's only got two more fights than Carlos Prates. It's a wealth of experience on the side of Li Jingliang. And Carlos Prates, another reason for the pick is Carlos Prates, even though he's a patient sniper and he can, you know, he's he wants to be on the back foot. He allows his opponents to dictate the fight. And I'm not just talking about Trevin Giles, although look at round one of Trevin Giles, but nothing else. Stop right after round one. And uh, you'll see he can be pressured. But even on the regional scene, guys he smoked, even in like round one, everybody was able to crowd him and pressure him at some moment. Maybe not everyone, but a lot of opponents. And it's just because of his style. It invites that. He's waiting for those kill shots. And he's got kill shots with his hands, like most fighters. Most of his knockouts are with his hands. But the difference with Carlos Prates is his kicks, his legs, his knees and kicks. He's a fucking killer. 
It looks like he can put his knee through your heart, come out the back of your fucking body, your torso. He's a killer. But he's not perfect either. Even though he's looked perfect in the last 10 years or so, he's got this one loss that it's by decision to Gajimurad Abdulayev, who still hasn't uh, panned out completely, but he's an excellent prospect. Uh, 8-0 and uh, killer. And I believe the one guy he didn't kill, didn't finish, was Carlos Prates. I really wish I could see that fight, but whatever. They're not always available. Uh, but other than that, though, he's got five other losses, and they are finishes. One of them was a TKO with an injury. doesn't really count, unless he keeps getting injured, of course. And the other one was a TKO which he, in which he was overwhelmed. This guy, Mikhail Romanchuk, who really reminds me of Mark O'Madson, just teed off on him. There wasn't one shot that really made Prates wobble. His chin didn't fail him at all. But he just let himself get hit with a thousand punches in the first two minutes of the fight, being teed off on. And you could see he was trying to do this calm under fire, wait for the perfect knee to the body routine. And he tried and tried, but he kept failing, kept getting teed off on. And then he just wasn't able to put out that fire and he succumbed to it. A two minute loss where he wasn't able to adapt and got TKO'd. Wasn't the greatest look for his adaptability and whatever, but I'll say this, it isn't a strike against his chin. Unless he was really wobbled and I missed it there. His other losses are by submission. All of them are pretty much over 10 years ago. One of them's about 10 years ago. The other two even passed it. Uh, so you can pretty much dismiss those. I shouldn't be using the word submission too much in this video. I've already used it like five times, but just know that I know that one of the losses, it says it's to a triangle choke or whatever, and it's a Darsh choke because MMA al dente watches the losses. Uh, still though, in the last 10 years or so, in every fight I've seen, he's, uh, he's made it happen. Carlos Prates. He's a killer. He's able to take his opponent's pressure, figure him out and, he still got that killer power, keeps it deep into the fight. That Trevin Giles knockout came at the end of round two. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, I see what everybody else sees. He's got a lot going on, Carlos Pratas. It makes sense to me that he's the favorite here. But he's still not my pick. Just makes sense that he's other people's pick. But I'm going with Lee Jing Liang. I think Lee can crowd him, win that pressure battle. I think if it does go to the scorecards, Lee would only be losing if he was uh, roughed up with some big moments for Carlos Prates. But otherwise, I think the pressure and the power and the punches from Lee would be winning the points battle. And also, Lee has got a great chance of having that next level power to knock out Carlos Prates, where he's uh, he can't be as comfortable on the back foot. You know, even somebody like Trevin Giles who's proven to have knockout power. He doesn't hit like Lee Jing Liang. You can't just give up a round to Lee. So... I think uh, Lee's got a a lot of good uh, different uh, factors in this fight in his direction, and he is my pick to win. Also, I think either guy can frankly score points with takedowns, but Lee especially. Carlos Prates seems like he's the type of guy that can get you in touch with your inner wrestler, and even though Lee Jing Liang is not Mr. Wrestler or Mr. Grappler, he's got it in him, and this would be the fight to mix things up. So... I'm going with Lee Jing Liang over Carlos Prates, but it's not my most confident pick. It's just because of uh, traits and the rest of it and yada, yada, yada. Uh, as for the bet, Lee Jing Liang is the pick, uh, is the bet. I bet on his money line. I'll wait to see what the props look like. Most of the time when he wins, it is by knockout, even though, again, there's no chin issue that's obvious with Carlos Prates. And decision would be my second pick for Lee Jing Liang. So I'll see what that looks like as well. As for Carlos Prates winning, I'd be surprised, even though Li Jing Liang's never been knocked out, I'd be surprised if Prates won, won this fight by decision or submission. I just think he's that fucking deadly where if he's winning and beating you up in the fight, you're getting finished because he's such a fucking potent finisher. Uh, but I'll see what his lines look like as well. As of now, nothing but the money line. I'm going with Li Jing Liang. Next, we have pretty much a heavyweight version of the last fight. Tai Tuivasa versus Jairzinho Rosenstruck. This is a fight between two potent knockout artists, and I've got this one ending via knockout. My prediction is Jairzinho Rosenstruck. Of course, if I'm wrong, Tuivasa via knockout. But I'm going with Jairzinho. 
Uh, both guys are incredibly dangerous. Similar records, they each have 14 wins, and in their 14 wins, each guy has 13 knockouts. So that's how they get it done. Uh, Jay Uzinho, both guys have been knocked out a few times as well. I may as well just talk about that here at the top. Jay Uzinho was knocked out by Francis Ngannou, who just overwhelmed him. And then two years ago was also TKO'd by Alexander Volkov. Volkov is one of the top heavyweights and obviously a unique physical challenge. Tied to Ivasa, he's got three knockout losses. Junior Dos Santos beat him six years ago. It was a little too much. Junior wasn't quite in his prime, but he was too much for Ty. Dragged him into the second round and then got him out of there. And then he was knocked out by Sergei Pavlovich last year, who is still one of the most dangerous men in the world. And also he was knocked out by Cyril Gunn in round three, which Cyril is still one of the best fighters in the world. And that was actually a very good fight. Ty gave him hell in round two anyway, but... Uh, Cyril was still a step ahead and ended up getting him out of there. Uh, they've each been defeated on the ground, but I think, uh, you know, whatever, there could be points to be scored on the ground, but I don't want to be talking too much about points and submissions in this fight. It's about power and chin and striking. And I do think Jairzinho should win. I think he's a little more com comfortable on the back foot. Tai Tuivasa can be more aggressive and that can definitely work to his advantage, just trying to crash into you. But uh, Jair Zinia Rosenstruck is a good counter striker. He's got a really solid, accurate left hand, and I think he's going to land the better shots altogether. Although, again, should things go to a decision, tied to Ivas, I expect to have the pressure on his side. Power is close. Uh, I really don't know. I mean, tied to Ivas, he's thick Samoan guy. Seems like it's tough to hit harder than him. But Jai is in your struck. He's an excellent kickboxer, much more decorated guy, a lot of experience, and he's been able to maintain the same knockout rate as Tai Tuivasa. Both guys fighting at a high level for a while now. Yeah, Jai is in your showing it even in the final seconds of a five-round fight. He's still got that danger to turn the fight around. And uh, Jai is in your struck. I also think I'd give a slight edge and durability to him over Tai Tuivasa. I just went over their knockout losses. Either guy can be put away, and each guy's got the knockout power to make it happen for his opponent. But I still think Jairzinho Rosenstruck's just in a little bit better shape, just a little bit better. You know, and it's all tough to gauge. These are heavyweights, so I don't know what the age really matters. Uh, but Jairzinho is five years older. He's 36 years old. It's not quite the same as being a 36-year-old welterweight like Li Jingliang, but uh, it's not nothing. Tai is the younger man. Still, Chai is in your Rosenstruck. I don't think the wheels have come off. I think uh, in most fights that are striking, especially against a guy that's not a really difficult physical match, like Volkov or Francis Ngannou, I expect Chai Uzinho to be able to figure him out. And that's my pick here. I think it's a firefight. I think uh, both guys could have dicey moments or it could just end when the first guy gets the other guy clipped. But I'm picking Jairzinho Rosenstruck to clip tie to Ivasa, whether it's early or in the middle of a firefight. And I think he gets the better of that firefight and wins. Jairzinho Rosenstruck by knockout is the pick. I haven't bet on him. He's sitting at the minus 225 right now. Uh, it's not the worst number in the world, but these are very dangerous heavyweights, and they've both been knocked out. I don't know. I'm going to stay away from that. I'll wait for the props because I think if either guy wins, it is by knockout, and I'll look to play my pick, uh, Jai Uzinho by knockout. Uh, and, of course, on the flip side, Tai Tuivasa, if he wins, it's by knockout. You could probably just play knockout itself, which will probably be really shitty odds, minus 400 or something. But I'm very sure this does end via knockout, and the pick is Rosenstruck. Up next, we have Mateusz Gamrot versus Dan Hooker. My prediction for the fight is Gamrot wins, and he wins by decision. I haven't bet on him because he's minus 325. I'll wait for the props. He's a very talented guy, and while he's got plenty of different ways to win, the primary path to victory for Gamrot is decision. So I'll be looking for that as far as the props go. 
But on the flip side, Dan Hooker, his money line of plus 260, there's value on that. I haven't bet on it, but I'm tempted to. I think if Dan Hooker can take away the wrestling in this fight, he's favored to win it. I'm just thinking Gamrot's going to be able to out-wrestle him. And it may not be a thorough 15-minute out-wrestling, but I do think Gamrot is just that relentless. And where everybody else falls off, his wrestling stays pretty sharp at the end of the fight. And I'm counting on it to be the difference against Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker, he's been defeated 12 times. I mean, he's been through it. Most of his losses are by decision, but he's lost a few times by submission and knockout in the UFC. Edson Barbosa TKO'd him in a fucking real uh, ass kicking where Dan Hooker showed so much toughness, but ultimately wasn't able to stand. He was knocked out by Michael Chandler, who hits like a fucking freight train. No shame there. And he was overwhelmed by Arnold Allen. I don't think Mateo Gamrot can win like that. He's knocked out Scott Holtzman, but that's really the anomaly as far as his TKOs go. Gamera's not Mr. Knockout. Uh, Dan Hooker has lost three times by submission, uh, one of them being recently uh, a Kimura to Islam Makachev. And by recently, I mean fucking three years ago. But that's the only time he's been submitted, even somewhat recently. And while I don't think Gamrod can do that, uh, well, I don't think Gamrot will do that. He can do that. Gamrot's a very talented grappler. He had that same type of victory over Jeremy Stevens. Just ripped his arm off. I think uh, Dan Hooker's got a little more to offer there, but still, it's a possibility. Uh, but Dan Hooker, his, uh, you know, even though he's not the easiest guy to just out-wrestle, not a lot of his losses are him being out-wrestled and uh, uh, losing by decision, but I still think it's possible here for Mateo Gamrot. Because that is his style. He's got that relentless cardio wrestling that not a lot of other fighters have. And Gamrod also has durability to back it all up. He's got two losses. Both of them are by decision. Both of them in the UFC. Guram Kuta Deladze beat him by very tight split decision. Really could have gone either way. And Gamrod's wrestling was still sharp for him, even down the stretch. And his other loss was to Benil Dariush. And that's one where his wrestling wasn't there for him. Uh, Benio was able to take it off the table and land the better shots. And I do think that's the path to victory for Dan Hooker, but I do think Gamrot will be able to go through the wrestling at Dan Hooker, uh, unlike he did the Benio Dariush. Again, Gamrot is on that next level with the wrestling, and uh, he's got that a lot of those traits where he just doesn't stop. We saw each guy have a razor-thin fight against Jalen Turner. Dan Hooker outdogged him. I hate the fucking dog fighting terms, but he, that's what he did. And he outlasted uh, Jalen Turner and really outworked him down the stretch. And Mateo Gamrot, he didn't outlast uh, Jalen Turner, but he did narrowly outwork him. It was still a really close fight and Jalen Turner's danger was there for him. But Gamrot was able to survive and always make it back to a wrestling battle and uh, scratch and call for a victory. I think both wins were split decisions but still, Gamrot, he's got those traits. He's got that wrestling. And there's no sign of any real major weakness in him. Again, the fight didn't go his way at all against Benil Dariush. He didn't come close to falling apart. And we've seen him tested in a lot of these close fights where he's still a dog in the end of the fight. Against Jalen Turner, Garon Kuta Deladze, and whoever else. So, and Rafael Dos Anjos. My pick is Mateo Gamrot to win. I think it can be a close fight, but even if it is, I'd still favor Gamrot to have everything going against, uh, going for him to uh, outpoint Hooker in the end. Uh, but again, I'm not going to bet on Gamrot. Maybe I'll bet something if the props show up, but here he's too big of a favorite where even him by decision, I don't expect to be anywhere close to plus money. So I'm probably sitting back on Gamrot. Maybe I'll waste money on Hooker. But the pick is Gamrot by decision. In the co-main event, we have Steve Ursag taking on Kai Kara France. My prediction for the fight is Kai Kara France wins by decision. I think Steve Ursag looks close to perfect as a pro. He's got two losses, both by split decision, and you could argue he won both of them. Once against this tough guy on the regional scene in Australia, 
and the other was the world championship fight against Alexandre Pantoja. You could argue he should be the champion right now. And even if he loses his fight, as I'm predicting him to, I still think he's an elite fighter who can beat anybody in the world, including Kai Kaur friends. But I'm picking Kai to win because I think Kai is sharper on the feet. I think his hands specifically are sharper, and I think he's got speed on his side. So I'm envisioning him keeping this fight standing and narrowly outpointing Steve Ursay. Urseg, I mean, on, on paper, Kai Car France is more dangerous, but Steve Urseg's shown to have some decent pop in his punches that have come through for him in some big spots and in his kicks as well. I also think Steve Urseg is impossibly tough. I mean, the guy's really fucking tough, and he's got every trait going for him. I mean, go watch that other split decision loss he has against that guy, Sean Gauchi, Gauci, whatever, uh, back in. Uh, earlier in his career. It's a loss, but Steve Ursig showed a lot of great traits in that fight. And I don't, I'd be very surprised if Kai was able to put him away in any fashion. In fact, the only thing I would give him, uh, give him a chance of doing is knocking Ursig out cold because Ursig isn't going to quit or wilt at all. And on the ground, Steve Ursig is the much better threat than Kai Garfranz. Much better threat. Steve Ursig has really slick grappling. It's better than his striking. But at the UFC level, I think, with his lack of physicality, he's going to be more of a striker just because he's not able to impose himself physically and get the fight to the ground. He'll still get fights to the ground, and if he does here, he's uh, Kai Car France is in trouble. Not immediately or anything, but Steve Ursag is better on the ground. Uh, but I still think here Kai Car France will be one of those fighters who's able to keep the fight standing uh, removing the grappling of Steve Ursig from the equation and then look to narrowly outpoint Ursig. Ursig, his two losses have come by being out wrestled largely to Pantoja and the guy Sean Gauchi. Even though, again, you could argue he won both fights. But after watching him, you'd have to say that was probably the difference on the scorecards. Uh, and that is not something Kai Car France can do. And, you know, I usually look to the losses for the blueprint on how to beat the guy and whatever. But I think Kai Car France will come up with a new blueprint here. And I think it is outpointing Steve Ursig on the feet with his hands. He's given up four inches of height, but he does have one inch of reach, Kai Car France. And even though he's, uh, you know, I was just talking about how Ursig is more dangerous uh, than he's given credit for and how Ursig is incredibly tough, Kai Car France is the overall bigger threat on the feet. He does have 11 knockouts in his 24 wins. And say what you will about the durability of Cody Garbrandt and even Rogerio Bontorin, who got knocked out in his next fight, I believe. But Kai Car France, has, uh, his power has hit the surface a few times already when he's needed it to in the UFC. Uh, still, though, I think uh, this is a fight that will be close, even, even if Kai Car France wins. He's got to watch out for Steve Ursek striking can change the fight on a dime as he did with David Dvorak clipping him with a big kick. He's got some mean check hooks and uh Kai Car France, even though he's only been finished twice in the last uh, 10 years, let's say, and to incredibly high level guys, he is still the guy who has been finished. He was knocked out twice a while ago, well over a decade ago. And then his only other knockout loss was the body kick to Brandon Moreno in the interim title fight or whatever that was in round three and his uh one only submission loss in the last few years has in the last 10 years has been to brandon roybal who is an incredibly dangerous submission artist uh just uh, incredibly dangerous and uh that was a wild fight anyway so uh whatever there's a little forgiveness there with the durability of kai car friends but i do acknowledge that, yeah, despite fighting the much better competition over the last 10 years, he's the guy who has been finished. So just know that I know that. But again, I'm going with Kai Car France. He's the guy who has been controlled and he's bounced back. That Askar Askarov fight was a great example of all of his traits coming together and getting him his best victory. Askar Askarov's an incredible victory to have. And Kai Car France, scratch and clawed and took away that whole realm of grappling and uh, really took over the fight after round one. So 
I'm taking Kai here. It'll be close, but I've got him winning by decision. He is my bet as well at plus 155. And I will at plus 154, if you will. And I'll wait for the props too, because I think if he does win this fight, I'm very sure it's by decision. Again, he's got good pop in his punches and all the rest of it. Steve Ursaig is really fucking tough. And when the going gets tough and shit goes against him, he doesn't wilt at all. So uh, Kai Carfrance by decision is the pick, and that will be the bet when the props. And in the main event of the evening, we have Drakus Duplessis defending his middleweight championship of the world against Israel Adesanya. My prediction for this fight is Drakus Duplessis wins. And I guess I'll go with him winning by decision even though it doesn't make a lot of sense based on his record. Uh, but I think he's going to need to rip the fight to the mat to win this. On the flip side, I think Israel Adesanya's only real path to victory is knockout. And I know I've seen every one of his fights. I know he's won plenty of times at the UFC championship level by comfortably cruising to a decision. But I don't think that's a path to victory against Drakus. I think Drakus, if he's going to lose this fight, it's him getting clipped. He's had sloppy striking that I've been critical of for since, since I've known the guy or known of him. And Israel Adesanya is precisely the kind of guy to exploit striking, slop, uh, sloppy striking or striky slopping. He'll, he'll exploit that too. Uh, but Adesanya, despite getting older, now he's 35 years old, just turned 35 recently. And he lost a year ago to Sean Strickland. Wasn't his best performance. He got clipped early hurt really badly, survived, even briefly took back control of the fight, but then was just slowly dying a slow death against the pressure of Sean Strickland. And I do think that's pretty much what will happen here. That's my official prediction anyway, but it's not going to be so much on the feet. I think Drikas can make things work for him on the feet, but he's really got to be careful in this fight. He's really got to be careful coming into Adesanya's range and getting caught by those sharp hooks he has. Uh, if he gets caught in tight when his guard is down, uh, that's going to be big trouble. Adesanya is more dangerous than he'll be given credit for. He's an incredibly dangerous guy, and he's really comfortable with you pressuring him on the back foot, with you putting him on his back foot. A lot of guys aren't, but Israel Adesanya is. So it's just a very dangerous matchup with a lot of traps for Drakus Duplessis. I think Drakus still probably does have power on his side. He's a big, strong fucking middleweight, and he's definitely got physicality on his side on the inside. He gets in tight with Adesanya. He'll be bullying him, but he's got to get in tight. He's got to get in tight to win this fight, and I think he's got to rip Adesanya to the mat. Adesanya has lost like that. Got to point to the Jan Blahovich fight. That's how he lost. Jan, who was maybe a half step behind early, but was still a technical match for him on the feet, he really cemented the victory by getting Adesanya down in the second half of that fight and controlling him on top. Drakus Duplessis, I'd say he's got the wrestling advantage. I'd say he's got the grappling advantage. I'd say he's got the strength and power advantage. He's got a lot of assets in this fight. He's got to keep himself safe. Because on the feet, Israel Adesanya has better fundamental striking, a much more diverse attack, sharper kicks every which way. And even though I'd say Drakus Duplessis is the more powerful guy, and I did say that like three times already, Adesanya is deceptively powerful and good enough to knock out Drakus. Drakus only has two losses. One of them's by knockout. One of them's by submission. Roberto Soldich knocked him out in their rematch in round three. And Gareth McClellan, former UFC fighter, submitted him deep into round two. These losses are both ages ago, but even though he's whatever he is in the UFC, 8-0 or something or whatever in the world champion, Drakus can't be denied on paper, but he still had a lot of dicey moments and sloppy fights on his way to the championship inside the octagon. The Derek Brunson fight was a sloppy mess. Those are two of the sloppiest fighters, Derek and Drakus. The Darren Till fight was one that was close. Brad Tavares was taking it to him early. Drakus isn't a perfect fighter, but that's the basis for the pick. He hasn't, he's faced a lot of adversity and he's had an answer every single time. 
every single time. Darren Till, the way he reclaimed control of that fight and st stole it in the end in round three. Brad Tavares, he took over, won his first decision against a guy like Brad. The Sean Strickland fight was razor thin, really could have gone either way. And yeah, I thought Strickland won round five. So he was the last man standing in that sense. But Drake is still, his traits were there for him. And he looked like a championship fighter in that fight. And of course, his best win is over Robert Whittaker. I don't know, I guess it's over Sean Strickland. Whatever. But the Robert Whittaker fight really impressed me because that was a fight where I was sure Whittaker was going to exploit the technical striking sloppiness of Drake's Duplessis. I said Whittaker's too clean and he's got that power to back it all up where when he starts landing cleanly, Drakus is going to fall apart. He's going to get clipped and that's going to be it. And he kept pushing through, switching stances, roughed up Whitaker with a right-handed jab and overwhelmed him with that danger and that physicality the second he had him on skates. He's had an answer for every question and that's the basis for the pick. That combined with Adesanya getting knocked out by Pareda in round five in a fight he was winning uh, and also getting roughed up and beaten by Sean Strickland. That was really the pressure that beat him in that fight by decision. But we can't forget round one where he was clipped very badly, dropped and pounded. So I, uh, I'm going with Drakus. I, I think his path to victory is ripping out Asanya to the mat. Uh, he's got the smallest of chances, but he does have a chance at a, of a knockout standing. And on the ground, he's better. Where rather than just sitting on top of him like Jan Bohovic, Drakus is a little more active. He might be able to make something work grappling-wise on the ground. To be honest, I would advise against that. I think he'd be better off going the Jan Bohovic route and keeping Adesanya on his back. Whatever Adesanya has to offer grappling-wise, and it's not nothing. You saw the triangle choke against uh, Kelvin Gastelum in the final minute of the fight or whatever. I think, uh, or whatever that was, I think Drakus will be able to survive anything Adesanya has on the ground, and he's winning that fight in any position. So is he, uh, Drakus by decision is the pick, although he's got more ways to win. And as for a hedge, Adesanya by knockout is the hedge. I think if Israel Adesanya wins, I'm very sure it's by knockout with the pressure from Drakus and the power and the wrestling, the rest of it. I don't think he's as likely to win a decision here as he is against Marvin Vittori and Jared Cannonier and the rest of them. Uh, so that would be my hedge knockout for Adesanya. It was always going to be my pick up until Drakus made a believer out of me. But he made a believer out of me, and I've got him staying champion by facing some tough moments here, but pushing through and answering every question as he's always done. Drakus by decision is the pick. Drakus is the bet as of now, and I'll wait for the props so I can waste money going every which fucking way. Like, share, subscribe, all that horse shit, and check out my other videos, including the prelims video, which will be uploaded soon.